Let us go to the word, John 6, 53 to 54. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Again, 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen. And also Hebrews 10, 19 to 20. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Amen. God is the God of grace. 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 Because he freely gives what is the best. Ephesians 1.6 uh, reminds us that. And to those who know his grace. He does not stop showing his kindness, his grace. So Ruth 2.20 uh, talks about that. He does not stop showing his kindness. Not stop. Meaning without ceasing. Continuously shows his grace. Gives his grace. That's what makes him the God of grace. Do you welcome this God? Yes? It's to believe that God is the God of grace, um, which is having faith. And a step further it means to receive the greatest gift from God. It's to receive the gift of God. Gift from God. Because grace, hey, karis in Greek means gift. And that gift is not uh, from the world or from humans. But it's it's the divine gift. It comes from God. It is only from God. It is only by God because he wants to, because of who he is and that he is the God of grace. So it is to receive the greatest gift from God. What do you think is the greatest gift of God? The gift from God. A job. Straight A. A beautiful wife. A beautiful house. A nice future. What is the greatest gift from God? It's the blood of of God. It's the blood of God. Acts 20, 28 says, it's the blood of God. We know the blood, the precious blood is the precious blood of Jesus, blood of Yeshua, as we call him here, his name, Yeshua, the Savior. But that blood is the blood of God. So having this faith, we have to live our lives each and every day living by this blood, living by the blood of Yeshua, as we just read in 1019, by, it is by the confidence we have gained through the blood. It is by his blood, through his blood, that we do all things. We do all things and we overcome all things by his blood. Amen? Amen. By his blood. Say it with me. By his blood. By his blood. Because of his blood. Yeah, because of his blood. Um, what makes Christianity unique um, and therefore it cannot go under religions or be defined as religion, although it has religious side to it. So outsiders may say, oh, you're just one of the major religions, major organized religion, and the other ones being Islam, Judaism, and so on. So uh, uh, for the outsiders, in other words, the world, Christianity or the Christian faith may be like one of them. However, uh, Christianity is not religion, for a religion is... Uh, Something that emerges from man, it originates from man, man's desire, uh, and from their own heart and their imagination, they create the idea of God and ways of God. And when one has done that and becomes a leader of that religion, others follow that. So it's through the ideology, or you call it enlightenment, as in the case of Buddha, right? You sit, you sit under a tree and you think deeply about what life is about and how it's all about suffering and you need to beat your body and stop doing what you need to do and become free from that. And then, bada bing, it's just like, you're enlightened. You're enlightened, you're in the world. You've figured it out. And all your students are going, oh, we follow you, right? So that is... Um, a way of looking at religion, which is following the enlightenment of another man or the, uh, the ideology or teachings of the man who finds um, that faith or that belief. The uniqueness of Christianity by comparison or contrast 
is believing in the blood of God, the blood of Yeshua. Did you get that? Yes? So it's to receive, it's to believe and receive the blood of God. Amen. Romans 3.25 says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. To be received by? Not by sitting under a tree or meditating or fasting 100 days. 100 days? Never mind. 40 days. 40 days. 100 days. 40 days. As if 40 days is easy anyway. Yes? Three days we barely survive. Yes. So it's, if there were to be a price tag on it, then it would not be grace, would it? Because grace means freely given without a price, ta price tag. Not because it's cheap, not because it's worthless, but because it's just the opposite. It's too costly for anyone to pay, pay a price to deserve it. That's why God had in mind in the beginning to give it. So why blood? Like blood? It's like blood. It's like we know that we are living because physically there's blood running through our bodies. And because of blood, we are alive. And when the moment that blood is seen on, coming out of the body, it's closer to death. So blood is life and death. It really is about life and death. So because of blood you live and because if you lose blood, then you die. Uh, even little children know that. So when they start seeing, if they have a nosebleed and they have a paper cutter and go, ah! so it means like, I'm going to die. I'm gonna die. So they understand some connection between blood and their life. Um, and because blood, uh, one uh, describes it as life-sustaining fluid. A biologist, uh, I saw biology writing saying life-sustaining fluid it is um, because it brings oxygen uh, and nutrients to all the parts of the body and so that the body can work because body is just one gigantic, amazing, incredible machine, if you will. But it, without blood, it can't run. It can't live. Um, it carries, so it brings oxygen because oxygen is what the body needs, every organ, but it also carries carbon dioxide, which everything breathes out which is bad, right? So you breathe in oxygen and then you uh, breathe out uh, carbon dioxide and it, is, it carries it and other kinds of waste uh, materials to the lungs, the kidneys, digestive systems to get rid of the waste. So getting rid of the waste is not just what you do on the toilet, but your blood is also doing, your blood is doing that work. So it's really amazing. Um, and it also fights infection. Your blood fights infections and it also carries the hormones, which are so important for the function of your uh, body. So it's made up of blood cells and plasma. Just a quick biology review, just a quick one. Um, plasma is this fluid, um, yellowish fluid that has um, the blood cells, the red, the white, and then uh, platelets, the platelets um, and nutrients. So it has like proteins and hormones uh, as well as waste products that it's carrying around. So the red blood cell um, contain what's called hemoglobin. It's a protein that carries uh, O2, oxygen, uh, and it gets the bright red color because it's uh, oxygenated from the lung. So the, from the heart, uh, the blood is pumped uh, and then it goes into the lung to be oxygenated and then it flows out to the entire body and it's flowing in the one direction. So it's going out and then it's supplying oxygen and nutrient, all of that to the other parts. Um, and then um, it lives about uh, four months, these red cells. And then every day your body is producing new uh, red blood cells. The white blood cells, on the other hand, are a key part of the immune system. So it fights off infection, infection from like invaders, like bacteria or virus. Uh, it, sometimes some proteins um, also produce antibodies. So the white blood cells are important. So you, you hear about like blood cell count and things like that. So what you have in your uh, system. So you have to have a right balance and all that. Platelets, which I'm com I come to appreciate even more uh, reading a little bit about it. It's responsible for clotting, the clotting process. So when a blood vessel breaks, I love the way this was described in one place I read. Platelets gather in the area. All of them gather. It's like the plates are like, hey guys, something's broken right now. We got to go seal it off. So all the platelets gather around this broken vessel to seal it off so the leakage does not stop. There's a reason why I'm going over this. Yes, I'm going to have a point in the end to make connection with this analogy. So it, uh, it helps the clotting process. Um, it, work, it works with um, protein called clotting factors to control bleeding um, inside our bodies and our skin. So 
Uh, it's so important, but only survives about nine days in the body, uh, in the bloodstream. So the new ones are also made. So very, very important. If you think about it, what you see a drop, there's so much in there. Like so many things are going on that you need to have it run smoothly. Certainly diseases happen or whatever happens. So then there's a clotting. There are all these things not working right. But the way it's designed by the designer, the almighty God, Yeshua, this is how it works. I'm just so amazed. I don't know why biology or how biologists cannot be believers. It's like when you look at it, it's like, how can this be like by chance, right? So it's amazing how the blood is so critical to one's um, survival, life, uh, growth, uh, but also um, for betterment. It's, it's improving the body. It, even though it is aging, there's constantly breaking off and, and dying off, but the renewal, but that is all happening through the blood. I mean, of course, there are other parts of other things that are happening, but blood is critical to life and it has, it's simultaneously, the, the other side would be death. So if we understand how blood is so critical to the physical body, when God says he is the God of grace and he intended to show himself as that by giving his blood, you have to understand what that blood means. So for us to know this, we approach the Bible as the story of blood. You have to read the Bible as it's telling a story of blood. So in the beginning, um, before we read about any blood or bleeding, uh, we read how God made man from the dust of the ground, the flesh. And blood is part of the flesh, flesh that comes from dust. But because God had intended, intended to shed his blood, not the physical blood for the physical object, the physical receiver, because he's spirit, his blood is spirit, and the receiver has to be, therefore, spirit. God made man to be what? A spirit, a living being. So in Genesis 2, 7, God breathed into the man, the breath of life, and the man became what? A living being. A living being is spirit living in the flesh, so that the spirit is prepared you understand? It's like you have to understand it differently because m many people, even though they're saying Christian, oh, God sent his son to die in our place because we needed him because we made mistakes. He had to prepare to resolve or solve our problem. No, it's the other way around. It's according to God's will, his plan in the beginning, meaning in eternity, that God made us the way we are. We are spiritual beings, be ready to be sprinkled. So 1 Peter 1, 2 says, we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. So to be sprinkled with his blood, that is spirit, man was made a living being. Now this living being is the ancestor of all mankind, our ancestor, Adam. This Adam lived in the Garden of Eden where he was to live by the word of God, but he disobeyed the word of God when he was deceived by the serpent, who is the devil. We, later on, we, we read and we find out. Because of that, he was driven out from the garden, cut away, cut off from God, cut off from God. So Adam was kicked out of the garden. A flaming sword was put around the garden, signaling, representing the cutoff relationship between God. The, there is no more relationship, no more communication between God and men because of what? Because of sin. But God began his work because he intended. He knew all this will happen because all, this was all according to his plan and his design. Um, and we see the first incident in the history of the Bible that there is bleeding. Who's bleeding? Abel. There you go. Who is? Who was one of Adam's um, sons. So the two brothers, Cain and Abel, gave offering to God, but uh, only Abel's was received by God. So Cain became jealous, so he killed his brother. He couldn't control his anger, his hatred, whatever. So he killed his brother. As a result, God said to him, where's your brother? And then he says, oh, am I my brother's keeper? And so on. But then he said, God said to him, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What cried out to God? Whose blood? Abel's blood. And what kind of message do you think he cried out to God? Revenge. Revenge. Because he didn't do anything wrong. All he did was please God. I mean, he probably teased his brother. It's like only one of us got our offerings received. Yes, maybe he did that. And his brother was just like, just waiting for the moment. Um, and he killed him. Still, it was unjust. It was wrongful death. So his brother cried out to God, even in the shed blood. That blood is physical blood and it will fade away. But even so, God does not neglect blood cry. Blood cry. God does not neglect blood cry. Even if it's revenge, he hears it. Because he takes blood seriously. 
Later on uh, in Genesis 6, we read about uh, God's dispense, his schedule of punishing the whole world because of its wickedness uh, by, by water, by, by a deluge, which drowns a whole in, in the entire world. Uh, everything that breathes through its nostrils would be wiped away. But God speaks to Noah, whom he found to be blameless, and revealed to him his schedule and commanded him to build an ark to save him and his family. So, he was saved while the entire world, uh, the entire planet drowned and was destroyed. Coming out of the ark to a new, like, cleansed um, earth, God gives um, Noah uh, a command to live by. So until then, since the time of Adam, there was no command to mankind. But here is God speaking to Noah besides the fact that he was going to drown the world and he had to make an ark. But he commands him. He says in Genesis 9, 4 to 6, you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. So if you open the Bible for the first time and you get through this part, a snake talking to man, and then like there's a whole flood that drowns the whole world. Okay, I'm going to try it out, continue, not give up. And then what? Why? What's the deal with the lifeblood? So this is why you have to put on the lens of blood to approach the Bible. Then you can see the theme continuing. So here it's God saying to Noah, Okay, you survive this destruction. Now you need to live by the word. Do not eat anything raw, basically, because raw meat has blood in it. If you enjoy raw meat, thank God you weren't born then. Yes? Um, so uh, God continued, and for your lifeblood, I will um, surely demand an accounting. I will demand accounting from every animal. And in verse 6 is whoever sheds human blood, meaning murder, killing. So two things. Don't eat raw, right? don't eat blood, and don't shed other blood. Uh, man's blood. So that do not kill. So that was the commandment that Noah had to live by. Later on, according to his plan, he calls on a people coming from Abraham, the children of Abraham, later known as Israel, when they were slaves in Egypt. God sent Moses to bring them out. But of course, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, did not let them go out because they've been there for hundreds of years, 430 to be exact, and they were free labor, so he wasn't going to let them go. But because God uh, showed his uh, great signs, the 10 signs or 10 plagues that destroy pretty much, that destroy Egypt, the king surrendered. The last plague was the death of every firstborn. The, uh, during that night, whoever wants to live, Perhaps there was an Egyptian who listened to this and said, forget about my king. I'm gonna, I want to live, so I'll listen to you. So it doesn't matter who lived in the house as long as they had what? The blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb, later known as the Passover lamb. Passover. Why is it called Passover? The spirit of death would pass over if the household had blood. And because they were commanded to put blood around the door frame. So it's almost like a hurdle. Right? It's an invisible hurdle, but the blood will be put on. So the spirit of death would pass over if there was blood. It didn't matter who was inside. It was the blood that God was looking for. So the, he, they were known as initially he, the Hebrews or Hebrew slaves. They listened to the word of God through Moses and put the blood of lamb. And because of that, they were spared their lives and they left their slavery in Egypt following Moses, following the word of God. Do you believe that happened? There's a whole lot of people who still believe that, and they celebrate this time called the Passover, yeah? And that's what Exodus 12 talks about, and they were commanded to uh, commemorate the, this down the generations. So they were given in the desert, where they traveled for 40 years, the, the law. And the law, also called the law of Moses, was referred to as the covenant of blood. What's it referred to as? What's the theme today? Okay, so in Exodus 24, 68, Moses takes a bowl of blood, and this is a moment of con uh, contract signing. You know about contract, yes? Contract. So contract uh, is to say, I agree to these terms, and I'm giving my authority, authorization. Like, I'm saying yes to this, right? So the way they put the covenant, covenant basically means contract with God, a relationship with God. So God says, if you want to be my people, you need to obey my commandments. And to say yes to that, you need to shed blood. And if you do that, then I will be your God. You will be my people. And the people said, amen. So for that, Moses brought a bowl of blood of an animal, lamb. And half of it, he, put it, he splashed it against the altar of the burnt offering, where offering was given to God, sacrifice was given to God. The other half, what did he do with it? 
He, I mean, a part of that was saved to go all, all the way into the most holy place. But the other half was then to give into the people. To, they were sprinkled. The people were sprinkled. So half of it was to God, half of it was to the people, and it was to make the contract effective, the covenant effective. So that blood is also referred to as the blood of the covenant. And the people under the uh, law of Moses, how many commandments were there? 613. So there were 10 commandments, but there were 613 points to the law. And they were saying yes to that. They were saying, yes, we'll keep it. We'll try our best to keep it. We honor God and we'll be his people and he'll be our God. Simultaneously, they were commanded regarding blood, not eat it. To not eat it and not to shed blood, once again. But now, this time, it's more serious, if you will, because it's been uh, signed with blood. All right, so let's go to Leviticus 17. 17.11. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor any foreigner residing among you eat blood. Jump to 14. Because the life of every creature is in blood, that is why I have said to the Israelites, you must not eat the blood of any creature, because the life of every creature is its blood. Anyone who eats it must be cut off. I don't know if they still do it or not, but some parts of the world, I know in Asia, like as in Korea, and I know in some Southeast Asian countries, at least in the past, I don't, again, I don't know if they still do it, but they literally would drink animals' blood for longevity. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but I guess because they felt like certain animals have certain things and then they would go hunt. And I remember watching this um, documentary when I was young and I was like so horrified. These hunters hunting after deer because, you know, deer, um, the, the antlers are supposed to be, you know, good. And now there's like, yeah, supplements coming from that. Um, it's good for your um, blood, blood, Al albumin. Yeah, I think it's, that's the um, part that... Uh, it, it keeps your uh, blood healthy and clean or whatever. So what they did was they would take, I'm not talking about vampire story, but that was real life. They, they actually had like metal straw. And then when they kill the um, deer, they would just go after it for its blood because it's like warm and fresh and drink it. The blood. They drink the blood because they could live long life. I'm thinking like, oh gosh, all the parasites and all the all of that in there. But they did. And then, you know, they say like snake blood or whatever blood. So they will all go hunt for all kinds. And no wonder these animals are becoming extinct. Yes? <laughs> I don't know if they're just doing that. So there are people who have drank blood and are still maybe drinking blood to this day. But not the people of Israel. Because the law said, do not drink. Why not? Because the blood has what? Life. So when I say blood, you will say? There you go. And I say life and you say blood. Because it's the blood that makes atonement. What does, the, what does the blood do? It cleanses sin. It redeems sin. And it gives life. Three things. Say it with me. It cleanses and redeems and gives life. The blood was given to God. It was only to be given to God. You are not to shed the blood of any man. Do not kill. And don't drink any blood. Because it belongs to God. He is the owner of life. So on that same note... Uh, 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 what, it, what it's saying is you can't take your own life either because your life is not your life. It belongs to God, right? It's the same idea. So um, Psalm uh, 51, uh, 12 to 13, it says, Do I eat the flesh of bulls and drink the blood of goats? If I were hungry, I would tell you, for the world is mine, all that is in it. So the Lord is saying, everything is in it. I can eat or take whatever I want because everything belongs to me. That is the life of every creature, including humans. Um, so the so blood returned to God. That's the idea that the law uh, of the Old Testament instilled in the people. So the sanctuary, the tabernacle in the desert, was to remind them as the priests conduct the sacrifice, which was to kill the animal, burn the fat, but sprinkle, uh, pour it at the, at the ba base of the altar and carry the blood, the remaining blood, into the holy place and the most holy place to worship God. It was a place where blood was shed all the time. Blood was said. So they understood the tabernacle, the temple was a place where blood returned to God. Now there was a very, very important prophecy uh, regarding blood. In Isaiah 1 11, uh, it said, it says that I have I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Now God is the one who commanded the people of Israel for thousands of years to shed blood. Um, so, you know, to the other uh, peoples around the world, 
then and to this day looking at Judaism, especially in the Old Testament as they conduct the sacrifice, this was described as cult, the cult of Yahweh. Because like, you know, what religion like has like, I mean, certainly there are like pagan religions that killed and gave human sacrifice. But this was like so, um, according to the law, and it was so strict, uh, and that blood was to return to God and all of that. So they kept it for thousands of years. Uh, it didn't just last for a year or a hundred years, but thousands of years this continued. But here is God saying through I, uh, the prophet Isaiah saying, I don't want that. I have no pleasure in that. What? What does that mean? And now there's even more uh, interesting. Let's go to Ezekiel 39, verse 70. Very important, so we have to look at it together. Ezekiel 39, 17. Son of man, this is what the sovereign Lord says, call out to every kind of bird and all the wild animals, assemble and come together from all around the sacrifice. I am preparing for you the great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel. There you will eat flesh and drink blood. Let's read that again. Assemble and come together from all around to the sacrifice I am preparing for you. The great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel, there you will eat flesh and drink blood. Oh my goodness, whose prophet, regarding whom is this prophecy about? This is about Yeshua who would die on the cross to shed his blood, who commanded Drink my blood, eat my flesh. Are you getting the chills down my back? This is why the Bible is so beautifully perfect. Hallelujah. So while the people of Israel took pride in the temple, continued to do this, God is saying, I don't want that. That is only a shadow, as Hebrews 9 later says. Shadows are copies of the thing to come. And it's also in um, uh, Nahum 3.1, woe to the city of Blood full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. Lamentations 4, 12 to 14 talks about shedding, um, that they will shed uh, within the city the blood of the righteous. The blood of the righteous. Psalm 94, uh, 21 says, the wicked band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. That is also the prophecy about killing the innocent son of God, Yeshua, to shed his blood on the mountain, but it will be before the sacrificial feast. It will be for the sacrifice on this mountain where all will be gathered to come and drink. So standing before the temple, the temple mount on the mount, where the temple is, the temple of Jerusalem, where the name Jehovah was, and the stone tablets, the law of God was. What did one man called in calling himself the son of God say? Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. John 2, 19. The Son of God coming in the name of the Father, Yeshua. John 5, 43 says, in the Father's name he came. Matthew 1, 21. It means he will save his people from their sin. His name is Yeshua, not Jehovah. He's saying, destroy this temple. You can imagine the priests, the Jewish leaders who heard that and considered it as blasphemy. He de deserving death only. Because without that, you have no sacrifice to be made for God, to make atonement for one's sin. And that means you will die. You will die in sin. You'll be destroyed. But here's Yeshua saying, I'm not talking about this physical temple that's made by hands. But I'm talking about the temple of my body. The temple of his body that we put to death, but in three days be raised back to life. Only after his resurrection and receiving the Holy Spirit, John and, and the other disciples realized what he was saying. At the time, nobody understood, however. What he meant was, it will not, now the atonement will be made. The sacrifice will be given, not in the name of Jehovah, not in the blood of animals. That will wash, cleanse the flesh for a limited time. Because they would have to give every year the blood of animals. To not be cursed, to not be killed, but to live protected by God. Because they had made atonement for their sin with the blood of animals. But here's Yeshua saying, he came to die. That the God, the God who is from the beginning, the God of grace, became flesh. As John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was God. The Word was God with God. So, the Word was God. Who is God? God is he who knows no sin. God knows no sin. God has no sin, knows no sin. So here's the word in the beginning, who was God. He has no sin, knows no sin, and that word became flesh to dwell among us in John 1.14, it says. The word became flesh 
the word became man, God became man, God who knows no sin became man to do what? To bleed to death. Do you understand? To bleed, the word became flesh. The incarnation of the word was for God to come and die by shedding his blood. So what am I saying? Who is Yeshua? He is the word in the beginning. He is God. Who is Yeshua? He is God. He is God. And what does that mean? He is the innocent one without sin. Knows no sin. So all the bleeding, all the blood shedding of the animals in the temple in the name Jehovah, in the temple of Jerusalem for thousands of years until his coming, was a, a shadow, a prelude, a, a, a prophecy that will be fulfilled through the one-time shedding of the Son of God coming in the name of God, Yeshua. So in Hebrews 9.12, he would achieve what's called the eternal redemption. What kind of redemption? Eternal redemption. Because the Old Testament redemption was done every year. Because it was with the blood of animals. Animals that were one year old. So like your apartment contract you, you sign every year. As your landlord is like increasing your rent. You're like, darn it. And you're right sided. But if you want to live, you got to sign it, right? So that signing every year, that was what they did with blood, the blood of one year old animal. So it was... But temporary, because the blood of goats and bulls and goats cannot take away sin, as Hebrews 10, 4 says. Therefore, God sent his son, who is God, who was, who is of God, the essence, the very nature of God. When he became flesh, he, came, he became the body that has the function to live and die. It does not mean, however, that his essence changed. What's his essence? He knows no sin. Second Corinthians 5 21 says he who knows no sin became sin for us so the blood of the son would be shed the that would be the blood of God the blood of God means that it's a spirit it is spirit it's not a flesh so when he died on the cross when he would die on the cross he would truly die it would be total death for, by bleeding out that physical death is true but his essence is spirit just quick analogy is that our, our blood is uh, it's of flesh. It's of the flesh. It's a material. And it has um, genetic material. It has uh, chromosomes, for, for example. Right? How many pairs of chromosomes do we have as humans? 23 and me. Yes, 23 pairs. So 46. Like an, uh, dogs have what? Uh, 78, for example. 70. So all animals have um, even bacteria. Have like a pair of one or something like a circular uh, chromosome. So every creature has a chromosome, meaning it, it has ancestor. It comes from an ancestor. It has genetic information from the previous generation. But if you were to dissect, if you were to, the blood of Yeshua, what would you see? What would you see? What kind of blood is it? Does it have any chromo chromosome? Does it have DNA information? Does it have any information? Some people say half. Well, maybe he has 23. Because he got it from Mama Mary, 23. Can human come out as 23 chromosome? You don't have human. You have monster. You have deformed thing. He became fully human. But that human body is for him to live and die in. But the essence of it, the blood, is spirit without sin. Hallelujah. That's why he said to the disciples, he commanded them, drink my blood. Matthew 26, 27, 28. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. Remember the covenant, right? The covenant of the Old Testament was between God and, in the name of Jehovah with the people of Israel. Here's Yeshua coming and saying, now this blood will be shed for all the souls of men. It doesn't matter by birth whether you belong to, the, uh, whether you're Jew or Gentile, free or slave or educated, uneducated, civil or barbarian, man or it doesn't matter. If you're soul, you come as soul, your spirit. Because his blood is spirit, you come and say, I am a sinner in need of your spirit blood for its life to atone my sin and you may drink it to live. Hallelujah. That's why he said in John 6, 53, 54, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life 
I will raise them up at the last day. Hallelujah. So the son of man, he called himself, even though he's the son of God. The son of man refers to the fact that the God who came is, is highlighting the fact that he is the God who came as man. Say it with me. The, the God who came as man. Let your neighbor say the son of man and you say. Okay. The son of man means the God who came as man. That's the incarnate word. So why did, the, why did he call himself the son of man? The son of man who will lay down his life as a ransom for many. Because he came to bleed. Do you understand that? The God who is from the beginning, who created all things, who has no need, who, who owns everything, became flesh to bleed and die. Because he's the God of grace. Ultimately, he was betrayed by one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, who had ulterior motive. He liked Yeshua, but he wanted Yeshua not to be son of God or son of man who keeps on talking about his death, but to be a leader, a political leader to restore the nation. So that's why he betrayed, conspired and betrayed, hoping that he'd be proven innocent by the worldly court and then become their king. That's why he when he realized that they weren't going to release him and kill him instead, he said, I have betrayed innocent blood. And that's why he killed himself. If he had betray Yeshua for the 30 silver coins, he would not have killed himself, right? And the fact that he said, I betray the innocent blood, he knew well that Yeshua knows no sin, he's innocent. But he did not understand the will of the Father. That's why he ended up killing himself. And being brought to the mass of people, and as Pontius Pilate said, I find this man not guilty at all. I don't find him any wrong that he's done. But what did the people say in unison? Crucify him. We want to see his blood. We want to see his blood. Now, how evil could men be that, that they would demand an innocent man to be bled out in such brutal way on the cross? Because this was all according to the plan of God all along. As he hung on the tree, he had already bled out so much when they flogged him. But only ultimately at the cross, he would die, bleeding out. He poured out not just his blood, but also water. And as he breathed his last, what did he say? It is finished. The moment of his last breath, he was saying, it is finished. Meaning, I have come to do what, I, what the Father sent me to do, which was to obey his word. As John 10, 18 says, to lay down my life willingly. To lay down my, will, like, my life willingly by bleeding to death. Because the Father is the Lord of grace and the Father alone is the Lord of grace. And I know that when I obey willingly to death, he will not fail me. He will not disappoint me. But he will give me back my life. And not only that, he will be lifted up to become the heir of all things. Hallelujah. But simultaneously what happened was the son as he laid down his life according to Father's command, he was giving the Father the greatest gift. The father is not honored by creatures. The father is not honored by angels. The father is not honored by sinful things that perishes, that perish. Rather, he's honored, he's pleased by the holy one without sin, the pure, the flawless, without stain, without wrinkle, the eternal one who comes from him, who is of him, who is God. And that is the son who came from him. When he laid down his life, he gave his life as the greatest gift for the father. And with that life, the blood, he purchased the souls of all men. As Revelation 5, 9 says, that with his blood, he purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And said, Father, they are yours. Hallelujah. By that father, the father was truly pleased, one perfect. Perfectly, 100% and therefore received his life that gift and in three days the father raised the son back to life hallelujah through his death what else happened was that he condemned the ungrateful one the devil who was made an angel to honor and worship God without knowing grace he did so and that's why he became proud and, and rebelled against God and challenged God and that's why God punished uh, threw him out of the spiritual heaven to be judged at this moment and by his death what Yeshua did was he paid the price of sin. So we have to understand the function of his death and the function of his blood distinctively. His death paid the price 
of my sin. Can you say it with me? His death pay the price of my sin. Yes, our sins, but I have to believe that my sins were paid for. Because you can't just say our sins and you are just like sort of like out there floating on your own. Everyone needs to make personal connection with him to be his, your redeemer, your savior. My personal savior, my personal redeemer. Amen. Yes. So he paid the price of sin by dying. But why the cross? Because the cross means total death, complete death. There's no way to come back alive from crucifixion. And it is by bleeding out. So by shedding his precious blood, he would cleanse us, redeem us, and give us new life in the spirit. Hallelujah. After he was raised back to life, he was lifted up to the throne in heaven. That is described to be the throne of grace. As Hebrews 4.16 says, the throne of grace. As on the throne of grace, he is seated as the king of kings, but also the lamb of God. The lamb of God who was slain. The Lamb of God who still bears the marks of bleeding out. Because God is the Lord of grace. To be given the greatest gift for all men. What all men need is not just extension of breath. As in health. Living a long life. A better life. Financially secure. And socially or environmentally happy. If that were the case, God did not have to send his son to die like that. Why make us term, term, terminate, term, infinite, finite like this? He could have made us like angels, right? If that's what he wanted us to be. Why in, this, in, the, in these jars of clay did he make us? To live a short life like this. Because what he wanted to give was his blood. The blood that belongs to God. That alone is of spirit and for spirit to receive. So that they may have life that is eternal. Hallelujah. For us to have a chance to receive that the Holy Spirit came. Who is known as the spirit of grace. And the spirit of grace when he comes. In the believers who have called in the name Yeshua. To be the name of their personal savior. They have come to him and saying. I'm a sinner. A wretch. Without your blood. There is no chance for me to be saved. It is only by your blood that I am saved. To such believers, the Holy Spirit comes. Say amen if you believe that. That you believe that you're a sinner deserving nothing but hell. But it is by calling on his name and that you have received the precious blood of the Lamb of God, Yeshua. Amen. The Holy Spirit comes into such soul and lets you know what you have received by grace. And that is the innocent blood of God. Certainly after believing in Yeshua, as we experience answers to our prayers, there's health being given, uh, being uh, healed from sickness, and, and, and being saved from poverty, being provided daily bread, jobs, and, and a broken relationship being mended, and all of these things being recovered and restored. These are great testimonies, and they're all important, certainly. But ultimately what the spirit of grace has come to do is to let us know the greatest gift of God, the gift from God. That is his blood. That even if I'm taking away health. I'm going to be job. Taking away relationship. If I'm not left with nothing. Even so. The world cannot take away this greatest gift. That is inside of me. That is the spirit. Is the blood of God. Hallelujah. He lets us know that. And lets us testify. That the blood of Yeshua is the blood of God. And the blood of God is inside of me. Say amen if this is your confession. Are you sure? Yes. Who are you? I'm a soul. I'm a soul. I'm a spirit. Because you're spirit, you believe in the spirit God and you receive the, the blood of God that is spirit. Is it, is it red? Does it have like the red blood cells? And the, no, it doesn't. It's not red. Certainly when he died, it was like blood in people's eyes. Physically red, blood stained. So people tend to think about the cross, the blood, red. I mean, sometimes we do have to put an imagery in the color of red and so on. But he has no color because it's not material. It's spirit. And when we call on his name, his name coming to me as the name of my savior, the blood enters the spirit that I am. So even if I don't sense it, I don't see it, the Holy Spirit sees it. So when the Holy Spirit comes as sign, what do we do? We speak in tongues. We receive the gift of tongues. And when you speak in tongues, why do you, what do you then, how do you emotionally respond? You cry because you're so excited, so happy. Holy, the Holy Spirit has come. 
But what's even more important than that is the Holy Spirit came because I have the blood. Do you understand? Because I have the blood. How else are you going to prove that you have the blood of God? There's no way to know. But the blood of God that is in the spirit, the Holy Spirit sees. He only goes, enters the spirit that has that blood. Say amen if you receive the Holy Spirit. The blood of Yeshua is in me. Amen. So he lets us testify that the blood is the blood of God. So let's talk about some functions of the blood. What does the blood do? First, it cleanses. Hebrews 9.22, without shedding of blood, there is no cleansing. No forgiveness of sin. So all men became unclean in the spirit because of Adam who sinned. Adam, my ancestor, sinned. So I received the spirit of my ancestor, Adam. But with that, sin was inherited. So my, my spirit, I, I the spirit, became unclean. Unclean. But the moment I received the blood of Yeshua, some people say, well, I have sinned so many. I've lived my life without God for years and years. I need a bucket. A truckload of blood. A truckload of blood. And maybe if you are, like, you are out of physical blood, you might need a lot of blood to, to receive transfusion. But the spirit blood, the blood of Yeshua, you only need a drop. As in just one time calling, one time receiving is enough. That is eternal blood that cleanses eternally. Hallelujah. So the spirit that I am, even though my flesh may still be falling and making mistakes, the spirit inside is cleansed. It is pure. It is without spot, without wrinkle, without stain. Hallelujah. The blood of Yeshua secondly forgives. Ephesians 1, 7. What happened 2,000 years ago what Yeshua, when Yeshua died, the Savior died, he is called a redeemer. So what he's done, what he did, what he accomplished 2,000 years ago is called redemption. The redemption of my sin, of all our sins. Because when he died, he died to pay the price of all, the sins of all men in Adam. All men are one spirit, Adam, in the eyes of God. So what he accomplished 2,000 years ago was redemption. But the moment that I believe and call on the name Yeshua, Yeshua, I believe you are the Savior who is the innocent one, who is of God, who is God. That you shed your precious blood for me. I receive that blood. That is the moment that I am forgiven. That's the difference between redemption. When did it happen? 2,000 years ago. Forgiveness happens when? The moment I believe. I want you to listen very carefully. Yes, this is very important. This is the beginning of our faith, but also drives us to the result of our faith. So the moment that I am confessing, I am forgiven. And I, because of the blood, I can seek his forgiveness to this day, every day. The reason why he forgives me after falling and failing is not because what I've done. Because I look pretty, because I am young, because I'm talented. No, it's because of his blood. Amen. Third, it justifies. Romans 5, 9 says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? In the Old Testament time, for you to be called righteous, what do you have to do? You have to keep the law. How many? 613 points of the law. But you, like, failed one. Isn't that passing? 612, that's good enough, right? Nine out of ten, that's pretty good. No, not so. If you broke one, you broke all, James says. So to be called that, to be righteous, because if you're not righteous, you receive the wrath of God. That's why people feared under the law. But here's a new law in town, which is called the law of faith. And in the law of faith, all you have to do is believe in the righteousness of God that is Yeshua. What he had done is the righteous act. That by believing in that work, that I am not righteous, the only righteous one is Yeshua. What he's done is righteousness. So I believe, and by that faith, God says, you're not guilty. And what do you say? Hallelujah, hallelujah. I believe in the Son. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I believe in the Son. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Hallelujah justification happens because of the blood of Yeshua. For souls come alive. Romans 6 11 says in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. When we are baptized therefore, immersed in the water, you burn your old dead self. You're dead in sin. And when you confess, you confess with your body by bringing yourself, obeying the command of Christ to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them 
in the name Yeshua of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, in the name Yeshua, you go in the water, bury your old self so that when you come out, you're coming out alive because of the blood. Amen. When he returns, he's going to judge the living and the dead. And only those with the blood of Yeshua who have lived, been carried and overcoming, doing all things by the blood of Yeshua will be judged as the living. Number five, we're born again in that blood. Romans 8, 15 to 16. We call him Abba, Father. Because we have received the spirit of Christ, spirit, we belong to Christ. We have been now born again as children of God. As First Peter 1, 2 to 3, as, um, as I read in the beginning, we have been chosen to receive the sprinkling of his blood. That's what 1 Peter 1, 2 to 3 says. We have been chosen. So now we need to be very careful that chosen is not a predestination uh, statement. As in, you people here, believers, you are chosen to be saved. So you can do whatever you want, however you want. In the end, you'll be saved anyway. That's wrong. Because the scripture also says you need to work out your salvation in trembling and fear. Faith is necessary to be present tense, ongoing until the end because you may lose it. So what it means is, however, that being chosen is the human race, meaning spirit of Adam. God intended to sprinkle the spirit of all men in Adam from the beginning. He chose mankind to sprinkle his blood on. That's why he made us to be. Do you realize how precious the soul that you are? That to the eyes of God, in the eyes of God. God made us as vessels to receive his blood, God's blood. Because of our sin, however, we became children of the devil. But by receiving, believing on the blood and receiving the blood of Yeshua, we have been born again as children of God to call him Abba, Father. So we cried out at the retreat, what? Father! Say it with me, Father! 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 Our Father in heaven. Our Father is in heaven. He came as man and died in my place and he bled to death. That bleeding was for me to be born again as his child. So today I can call him Father. Even though I have nothing in common with him. So when you hear an attribute of God saying God is holy, God is righteous, God is almighty, God is the Lord of grace. And what am I? I'm not. 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 I'm not almighty. I'm not holy. I'm not righteous. I'm not merciful. I'm not good. I know no grace. I show no grace. I'm unworthy, undeserving. A wretch. But there's one thing that's in common with him and me is that I have his blood. Amen. We have his blood. That is the power of the blood of Yeshua. Hallelujah. And number six, he gives us the right. The blood gives us the right to serve. As I preached last week, Hebrews 14 says, well, how much more than will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Serving the Lord is good because there are people who come to church for the first time. I met many people coming. It's like, I have a gift for children. I have a heart for children. Can I serve? I said, like, oh, I'll take your number, but come back next week. Yeah. Or like, I love music. Can I serve in the music ministry? Uh, uh, first, we need to believe. Yeah, we need to believe. And make sure that you believe the right thing. And that you have formed a relationship with, with the Lord. So that your service, whatever it may be. Cooking, driving, playing music, teaching. Or working with machines or supporting. Whatever it is that you're doing is done by, with, and because of his blood. Amen. So coming into the house of worship on the Lord's day, as you hear me pray and Pastor Kang pray, every opening prayer is about by your blood, with your blood, through your blood, because of your blood. I'm not coming in because I am such and such. I've lived here. I've, I've served here for how many years and so on. It's not about that. It's because of your blood I have come. Because of all these things things that I'm grateful for that there's no way for me to pay for it's only because of your blood how much money can I offer to God that it's worthy of giving to God how many talents could you have what kind of special gift could you have that is worthy of God 
it's only by his blood. He's pleased by his own blood. That's why he gave it to us freely. So we have nothing else to say. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your blood. So on the Lord's Day, called Sunday, not Saturday, on Sunday, the way in which the day in which he was raised back to life to prove that he is God. We come in the body of Christ, we gather around the blood. Amen. We are in the gathering of the blood. Amen. So we praise the blood. Amen. Because we drank the blood. We drank the blood. Who are the disciples of Yeshua? Are those who drank the blood of Yeshua. That's what we do in communion. Communion is not that the juice or the bread turns into his flesh and, and, and blood suddenly. It's a symbol. But while we are doing it, it's that acting because he commanded that when we are doing it in, mem in remembrance of his shed blood. That I have made this relationship with him. That I bury myself through baptism. I have come alive. That I have drank his blood. So I praise his blood. I gather on his blood. I serve because of his blood. By his blood. For his blood. Through his blood. Amen. So in heaven what are we going to do? We're going to praise his blood. We're going to come together assembled. All the peoples. Of all nations and all tribes. Coming together on that mountain. In the holy city. Who have drank his blood and eaten his flesh. To celebrate in that sacrificial feast. Do you want to go there? Amen. We want to be there in that day. Amen. Seven. We can pray. And our prayers can be heard because of his blood. Hebrews 12, 34 says his blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel that cried out revenge. The blood that cried out from the cross is to forgive those who know not what they do, as Yeshua said. So when I pray to the fa Father and say, Father, it's the blood cry of Yeshua. When I'm crying out to him, he's in heaven and heaven is so far away out of this universe. How can he hear me? Because his spirit. And when I'm crying out, yes, physically I'm crying out in my voice. But the blood in the spirit that I am is crying out to him. He hears his own blood crying out to him. Would he not hear us? He will hear us. He hears us because of that. And when we pray, forgive us. And as number eight, the way to repent is because of his blood. And when I'm crying out, seeking his forgiveness, he hears because of that blood. First John 1, 7 to 9 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The most hopeful note of the New Testament after the gospel books is here. Because as you read through the epistles, and especially when Paul wrote... All the things that we ought to be doing as born again Christians, as children of God, we still fall so far from it. But as we read in 1 John, what John is writing is that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins and purify us and save us from all unrighteousness. This gives us hope. What do you say? This gives us hope. That even after falling so many times. That the blood cry in the spirit that I am can be heard as I seek his mercy. 1 John 2, 1 also says, he speaks in our defense. As I was repenting this morning and as I tried to do on the Lord's Day, preparing for service. How we have an advocate, our defender. And the defender has the marks on his body of bleeding to cleanse me. Cleanse us, but cleanse me. Redeem me. Redeem my sins. Redeem, atone my sins. He was broken, slain to give me life. That he's my defender. And he says, Father, even for her, I died. Even for him, I shed my blood. That is the grace of God. Do you understand people? Amen. So we can never give up. 
Even if I lose everything else and everything is taken away from me, I can never give up because of the blood of Yeshua. Hallelujah. So the, a disciple, a true Christian is someone to be found, long, put to every effort every day to be found as a fruit of his blood when he comes back. Do you believe that he's coming back? And when he comes back, he will judge the living and the dead. He's not coming back to bleed again. Instead, he's coming back to look for the fruit of his blood. This is why I said this message is the beginning, the basis, foundation of our faith, but also the outcome to which we are racing, towards which we are running. And that is to be found as fruit. When he comes back, he comes back as the master to reap his fruit. And we want to be found as a fruit of his blood. And the fruit of his blood is someone who does nothing without his blood. Meaning, everything that I do, it is with his blood and for his blood because of his blood. So my worship that I give him is because of his blood. I praise him because of his blood. So when... You come up as a praise team singer or whatever it is. You need to be shedding tears. Because you're distracted. Whatever you're thinking, you don't shed tears. Because you're thinking about something else. It's not like, oh, I'm going to squeeze some water out. It doesn't work. You have to live the, the whole week according to the word, praying for this moment. And that blood that you heard about maybe five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. That was shed 2,000 years ago. Is still moving. Because it's the eternal living enduring blood of God. How can it not still move you? He shed his blood for you. You can't even shed your tears for him. So when I praise him. It's because of his blood. When I serve him. It's because of his blood. Not because you're having fun with your friends. And because everyone else is doing it. And I'm going along. Jumping on the bandwagon, I'm going along. Yeah, we've had people like that. Jumping on the bandwagon for 20 years, 30 years. And one day they realize, you know what? I'm kind of tired of this. I don't know anything. I don't think this is the only place. I, I could find another church. I'm getting a little tired. I am burnt out. I need a break. If it is because of blood, you can never let go. You can never give up. What do you say? It's because if you do it by the blood, you can't stop. Because God shed his blood for you. That blood is inside you, the soul. And it is the driving factor. It's the driving force. Just like the blood cell running through the body to provide oxygen and nutrient. And running the whole machine. It's the blood of God. The innocent blood of Yeshua. That I can overcome even if, yes, I get challenged, I get tired, I get exhausted, I get tempted and tested. But I bounce back because of the blood. Hallelujah. Secondly, we must resist sin to the point of what? Shedding blood. Hebrews 12, 4 says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You need to resist sin to the point of shedding blood. Just as Yeshua shed his blood on the cross. Resist. Resist. Revelation 7, 14 says, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Washing in the blood of the Lamb it means sanctification. Our faith is in progress. I need to continue to change. I shed one thing. I shed another, another, another. I need to continue to wash. And the fact that I'm given this chance to wash and wash and be renewed and be sanctified is grace. And thirdly, it is to become a fence for the sheep in the body of Christ. In other words, fence means wall, pillars of the body of Christ, the church. Acts 20, 28, the, by the blood of God, he purchased souls and the church. The church was purchased by the blood of God. It is not a building. It's not just gathering of people. But this belongs to him because of the blood of God. So when we see church, when we see one another, we should see the blood of God. Amen? Then we should want to protect one another, protect the church, becoming the wall, becoming the fence. And you know, this is where I'm going to bring in the platelets. That rush to the broken vessel. Nosebleed, paper cut, the platelets are rushing, gathering around that broken vessel and say, Oh, we have to stop the leakage so that the body is protected, that we don't lose any blood. Let us all, all be together to support, to block. To keep, to defend, to protect. That 
That's what a Christian who has the blood of Yeshua in the spirit they are would do for the church. And lastly, is to become a witness of the blood of the Lamb. Amen. To be faithful witness, Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from it from death so it's to death become a witness of the blood of Yeshua why do we need to become witness because the world treats Yeshua as just a man a sinner who lived and died but we now having the Holy Spirit the Spirit of grace lets us know that the blood of Yeshua is the innocent blood of God that has done all these things that is still doing all these things in me in my life now I need to be used as a vessel that carries the message of his blood. That it testifies the innocence of his blood. That he is God. His blood is the blood of God. Amen. Say with me. I'm a witness of the blood of Yeshua. I will testify his blood. Because we have been chosen to receive the sprinkling. And not just us. All the souls walking out there have been chosen to receive the sprinkling. But many of them will perish and go to hell because they don't know it. That's why I need to go out and share and testify on his behalf the innocence of his blood. Amen? How great is his blood? That 2,000 years ago, one man, one man's blood, next to the two men, the th there were three men 2,000 years ago who died on, on that hill. But only one man's blood is in me right now, living and enduring and testifying that it belongs to God. It is of God. Because that man who died 2,000 years ago is not man, but he is God. He is Yeshua. Hallelujah. Let us pray. For us to be, receive his precious blood, the blood of God. For me to receive the blood of God. For me to be born again in the blood of God. To become a child of God. He made me as human. To receive the spirit of Adam. This was the plan of God all along. For me, for us to receive the sprinkling of the blood of God. How does that not move you? What, what will move you? If, what, what, what else will move you if you're not moved by this fact that God from eternity planned to sprinkle his blood and have this blood relationship with me? Me! I can only say thank you for your blood. I surrender before you. It's all because of your blood. Join me and lift up your hands to heaven. Whether fa where the father of your soul is, the redeemer, the savior of us, our souls, we souls. And let's call on his name and thank him. Thank you for this amazing gift, this amazing grace, Yeshua!